Hello, Living Word family. We are glad that you've joined us on YouTube. We want you to be a part of this message that touches your life every day. So on behalf of Pastor Pierre, my wife and I, we are glad that you engage. We want you to subscribe because there's so many messages on here that you could listen to on your leisure. We are glad that we're able to serve you. But we also want you to go to our website. When you go to our website, you will find a lot more information, even the sermon outlines. And also, you can provide an opportunity for you to see a list of our materials, books that you could look at that meets your need, and you could share with other family members or friends. We could also give. As you give to Living Word, you know us. When you go to our website and you do that, we use those funds to serve the agenda of God for the glory of God, and that allows us to serve you effectively. So we're glad you're here with us. Subscribe, be a part of this, and I pray you join us again and keep involved as God so leads you so that we grow through these times and are coming out of it better than we went in. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. What a blessing to scream out one name and things can change. For those who have, are tired, fatigued, been through a lot, I just want you to remember that there's one name that changes it all, and that is Jesus. So again, thank you, Exalt the King, for leading us in worship, but leading us to Jesus, most importantly. I know that this is a great time for us to recollect or remember um, our year. Some of us have had good years. Some of us are mourning. Some of us may be grieving. And I recognize that everybody is looking at this new year differently. Um, and I just want to make sure I'm sensitive to that. So when you preach a sermon like this, it's not always something that makes people trigger well. But I just want to know the church is here for you. We are here for you. If this has been a tough year for you, we don't want to say, oh, it's one of the mistakes we make is somehow when the second turns from 1159, 59 to 12, like everything starts new and we know that our problems will pick up right o'clock as soon as you wake up the next morning. So I just wanna make sure I don't set false expectations, but I give you the reality that grief continues, mourning continues. Some of your problems from last year are gonna be problems of this year, but God is still good. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. So I pray that you'll stick with me despite what you may be thinking. But I pray that you don't make a recollection of 2023 remove how faithful he's been till 2023. And then we'll talk about that as well. But what I want to do really quickly is, if you don't mind, I'm going to do something different. Second service, we didn't do read and respond today. So we're going to stand and read the text. I want you to see how beautiful this text is. And then we will dive right into the scripture. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. All the commandment that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land in which I swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness for four, these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers, that he might make you understand the man does not live by bread alone, but by lives in everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. I want to get to verse 6. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways and to fear him. You may be seated. Let us pray. Dearly Father, I want to say thank you. I know some people are coming to this new year with new hope, and that's amazing, and I pray we do. But I, what I pray for is that everyone here comes in believing and knowing that you have been good enough, no matter how the year was. That some of us are praying for things to happen in 2024, and amen, I pray for them as well. But at the same time, I don't want us to get too focused on what you will do that we lose sight of what you've done. Um, that sometimes what we're praying for is exactly what you're saying no to. Um, what we're praying for is exactly what you're telling us to wait on. And just because we're turning a year doesn't mean that you are now obligated to 2024. God, I pray for this sermon that it will do exactly what it's done and will do for centuries. It will convict, prod, correct, rebuke, equip, and encourage because your word is just that powerful. God, so I pray I'll get out the way so people will see the beauty of your word alone. And I want to say, God, I love you, and I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Say it with me, and you can say it together. What is often an old saying, a cliche? They say what? Hindsight is 2020. When you look back over time, hindsight is 2020. That means over time, back in the day, if you were to look back, you would realize that, oh, man, if I look back, man, I could see why this happened. I didn't understand it in the time, but I look back and I see why God allowed it. Now, uh, me and Monica were on a date the other day, and I, I appreciate date night. I do. I, I genuinely do. But we, 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 we were recollecting on some things that, that made me praise the Lord. Um, she doesn't know this, but internally I was just thanking God. She, we started somehow talking about uh, her exes. Now, I, 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 I'm going to talk about me in a second, but she started, she said, she was like, man, I remember in third grade, somebody dropped jewelry off in my mailbox. I was like, third grade? You've been killing these boys since third grade? She said a kid would just like rolled up on like with his, his bike. Can you imagine being in third grade and just, <laughs> and just dropping off your mom's jewelry? Like that, that's crazy to me. So she started telling me about all the boys who pursued her and liked her. And then she got to me and I was like, whew. Hindsight is 2020. I'm so, I'm so glad everybody else failed because uh, then it made me look attractive. So later on that night, I got my bike. I rode around the neighborhood, and then I went to our mailbox, and I dropped off some jewelry. It's, went up, it's amazing so far. She hasn't picked it up yet. And then I started looking about all the things that happened in my life, and I'm like, man, it's so glad it led me back to Monica. I'm so glad that hindsight 2020, some of the things that I was pursuing, some of the people that I thought was the one, some of the people that I even pursued on my own didn't work out because I ended up with my bride. Hindsight is 2020. And I guess what I'm trying to also say is that some of us, we have lost track. If you look back all the year in 2023 and you'll realize how faithful God has been and but sometimes it takes you to remember everything that you've been through to realize that God had a plan the whole time. That you thought they were breakups and God knew he was moving you forward. You thought the X mattered, but you didn't realize there was a future for you. That Some of us have to get to our future until we realize that it's 2020 in your past. And today I want you to look back and sometimes you say, this wasn't my year. Some of us are looking and saying, you don't realize how bad 2023 was. And I'm like, that's fine. And and I get it. But at the same time, what I'm going to preach is that if you remember and you remember well that God is looking at your past and say, I still got 2020 vision. So when you look to Deuteronomy chapter 8, he's going to ask you to do something. Then he's going to tell you why you should do it. And then he's going to go back to tell you to do it again. So this scripture is not hard. Setting it up is also not hard. And I want to make sure that we set it up well because he tells you straight up, I want you to do it all. Now, here's the kicker to the whole thing. It says right here, in Deuteronomy, it says, all the commandments that I am commanding you today, all of them. But I want to make sure it's very clear. Pastor Lawrence has a saying that he always says, and if you ever heard Pastor Lawrence preach, you can say it with me. If you've been in this church over one year, you've heard it. All means all, and that's all that it means. Now, I'm not going to disrespect my elders, and he's right. All is a very simple definition. But what he's saying is I want you to flash back to the promise I gave your forefathers, but also to the, all the commandments I told them to do. Every single detail I want you to do. I want you to go all the way back to Mount Sinai, and I want you to realize that he came down that mountain with everything I transcribed with my finger. I told you to do the kicker. The reason why he's telling them to do it is because they what? They ain't been doing it. See, you're like, well, Pierre, that's the simplest thing I've ever heard you say. Most of us in this congregation, in this sanctuary today, will do half obedience. We're good at doing what makes it simple. We're good at doing what promises a reward. We're good at doing what makes with no resistance. But the moment we hit resistance, the moment we hit something that tells us this ain't always easy, most of us have said, you know what? I'm going to do it halfway. How do I know this? When you're single and then you finally meet somebody and that person wants to do some things that you shouldn't do, you would say, man, I'm going to do a half obedience. We're going to cuddle. Some of us are married, right? And we're going to say, you know what? I'm going to love my wife as long as she act right. But the moment she starts tripping, she's going to see old me. I'm going to remind her who I was before I met you. And then the Bible somehow tells women to respect your man, but what if he's not respect worthy? Dang, that got a lot of mmms. That's crazy. Yo, that is crazy. The, the whole sanctuary, mmm, God, hold it in. Show some respect. That was an overarching groan. 
brothers, let's get our life right. We're having a men's conference right after this. Sheesh. That some of us right now have said, you know what, I'm going to respect him as long as he does things that I want him to do. That we're okay as long as we don't have to do all of them. I wonder how many of you, if you were to look through your life right now, this point's not going to take me long, is that some of us are doing only some of them. That we're, but here's the second thing, is if in order for you to know what all is, you have to read your Bible to know what he's telling you to do. That some of us only come to church on Sunday, never open it Monday through Saturday, and then we're like, well, I didn't know what you could have and you should have and you're held responsible for, but yet you still don't because you don't have the effort to know. God is saying, well, I told you everything you needed to do. And I'm not just going to leave it to marriage and singleness and all this stuff. Let's just talk about your job. Let's talk about your attitude that he told you to clean up. Let's talk about the fact that he told you to be slow to anger, but you still quit. There's an overarching groan that everybody can feel. Is that some of us right now are still doing last year's sum and expecting God to do all of what he told you he would do for your life. That some of us have said, you know what, 2024 is my year. Meanwhile, you're still repeating your sins from 2023. Like some of y'all are going out tonight talking about, I hope I find somebody. And God's like, oh, you will. I'm not sending him, but you will find somebody. Moving on. All that I am commanding, watch these words, today. I want you to do it now. Can we also talk about delayed, dis- delayed obedience? Can we also talk about the fact that he's saying, I want you to do it now? that you're compromising to what I've told you to do can't continue, that you can't keep saying tomorrow, that some of us have said, you know what, I'll do it when my life gets better. I'll, I'll act right. I'll stop drinking and smoking when I feel like it. And then some of us have even waited somehow until 11.59.59, and somehow you're going to break every sin habit you've created in 2023. Like God just drops a magic bomb and it's like 2024, ooh, I don't, like, I don't even like drinking no more. I want to stay single and celibate for the rest of my life. I mean, the guy's like, wait, no, like that's not how this works. The habits you created in 2023 will carry over to 2024, but today I'm asking you to do it. But you know what today also means, and I'll stop here, today also means you can only focus on today. That's all it means. Today, do everything I told you to do. That's it. And you know, some of us are so captivated by the whole 365 days of 2024 that you get anxious and fearful because you realize that 2023 wasn't your year. And God is like, wait a second, what are you doing? Just today, I need you to focus on today and everything I command you to do today, I just want you to do it. I'm in charge of the rest of the 365. You can't fix it. Just do your obedience today. And it, but then he says something. He says that you should be careful to do it. That means pay attention to it. This pay attention to word is hindsight 2020 that some of us, if we would have paid attention in the past, we wouldn't have repeated the mistakes in the present. That some of us, if we would have stopped to realize what God is doing, me and Monica were looking at pictures on our phone on Facebook, and we fostered two boys, and sadly, y'all didn't get a chance to meet them because they went back to their mom, and that was a sad day for our family. But I look back, and I'm like, God, like, I, I thought I did everything carefully. Like, I wanted these boys forever. And God said, no. And God is like, no, what, no. I, I said, you gave them six months of a gospel-filled life. You gave them love, but I decided to reunite their family. That's on me. Just, I just want you to be careful to keep doing the right thing. See, you can't control the six months. Even though we went to the Zoom court hearing, even though we did the best we could, even though we thought we treated them boys right, and I still miss them every time I see the picture. But that's not up to me. The best thing I could do is be careful. Be careful. You know what careful means? Careful careful also means that you got to be willing to let go of things that you want. Careful also means the more more you grow spiritually is the more details matter about your obedience. Have Have you ever been in a situation where you started realizing that the overarching obedience, you're missing some details in it? And I'll explain. I hope this makes sense. That loving your wife also means an action, and the action continues to grow over time. How many of you have ever realized that that loving your wife never ends? And I've met some seasoned saints who have got comfortable in their marriage where they realize how to get along, but they don't don't grow. They're not careful to get better. They just know how to do the bare minimum. And, And some of us, the more careful you become in your obedience is the more God expands what he asks you to do. But 
Again, I told you there's some reasons why you should do it. He's, he's fixing to lay it out for you. He says, be careful to do that you, you don't like this part. This is all my blessing saints. This is the 2024 is my year of prospering. This is the vision board, people. You ready? That may live and multiply. Now, if I could hoop and holler, I'd say, oh, everything in your life will multiply. You got one wife, you're going to get six. This is your year. I'm just joking. I just made that up. That's unbiblical for everybody got excited are scared. Someone's like, yeah, this is my year where money gets better. This is my year of savings. This is my year where I'm, and I'm just saying, hey, the crazy part about what he's fixing, what he's saying is he has already said it. This isn't a new thing. Like he's fixing to say what? The same thing that you will go possess the promised land that I told your forefathers. I've been keeping my promise for years. That's the crazy thing about what he's saying. You getting excited about 2024, and he's like, I've been keeping my promise since your forefathers. Like, nothing, nothing has changed. Like, I'm still being me. The reason why you're surviving the desert is because of me. The reason why you eaten in this desert is because of me. I kept my promise. What he's asking you is, will you keep yours? Like, your forefather, he said, I swore to them, and I've kept it ever since. And Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He swore to love you, and he's done it ever since. Nothing has changed with God. The reason I'm asking y'all is this 2024 won't be your year. Will it be God's? You've tried it your way. If you were to look at your last year New Year's resolutions, how did those go? Because I know how it goes in the gym. Like, I've been there. And I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm not trying to brag on myself, but I go three, four times a week. And I hate the beginning of the year. I'm not knocking nobody that's going to be your year, be your year. God bless them with their year. But I hate it because everybody with New Year's resolutions in the gym, but they be on their phones all the time. I'm on a time limit, y'all. Like, I got 55 minutes to get in and out this gym. You over here on the bench. This my year, y'all. Let me show y'all. I'm here at the bench taking pictures. Get off the bench. But don't worry. Come February... The gym is just me and the same girl that be there every day at 5 o'clock. That's swallowed than me. She be there every day. I I just wait till February. Trainers love this part of the year. They know they get every new contract. New Year's resolutions. He says, then he says, how? This This is why. See, here's the difference. Here's the kicker. Here's everything you need to know. Why would you do that? Why would you do everything he told you to do? Why would you stay celibate? Why would you continue to live in your singleness? Why would you continue to serve in your church? Why? And he says this. He didn't say you, hey, I'm going to bless you in your future. What does he tell you? Remember. He didn't even tell you, hey, because I'm going to give you the promised land, I need you to do something. No, he's telling you because of what I've already done, you should obey. Because of everything I've done in these 40 years, you should obey. How many of y'all love Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff? But Facebook has this algorithm where it takes all your pictures in 2023 and it creates a memory thing. All they do basically is somehow collect every picture where you's not at your house and you decided to smile. And then it collects it and then puts music behind it. That's pretty much all that it does. But it, it makes you look back, right? Because you'd be like, oh, I remember that. Aw. Aw. Some of y'all are like, ooh, <laughs> I remember him or her. <laughs> ooh, I dated him. Wow. Like, There's a lot of different things that people have different reactions to the memories. Even in your phone now will take all of your pictures. The iPhone will. Android probably just doesn't have them or whatever. But the, I, <laughs> the iPhone takes all of your pictures, stores it, and throws you a video. And God is saying, you looking only at 2023. How about I take your 30 years of existence, collect it into a picture, and send it back to you and be like, whoa, God, I didn't realize how faithful you were when I dated him, her, when I did this, when I was out here, when I was moving here, when I moved from this house to this house, and I went from an apartment to a home. How long have you been faithful to me, God? He's like, I just want you to remember. But then he tells you, I don't want you to remember just the year. I want you to remember 40 years. This is a killer. Because he not only starts to give you the parameters of how long you should remember, he starts to tell you what you should remember. He says this, remember the which way your Lord, your God, has watched these words, led you. Who got you here? 
The first step to you remembering is remembering who got you here in the first place. The problem is some of us aren't excited about where he got us. Do you recognize in the simplicity of the gospel that you being at church today is your first and only good blessing? I'm not talking about at Living Word Fellowship Church. I'm talking about the fact that you are grafted into a covenant where you are now saved, if if you are saved, by Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, you are blessed. Basically what I'm saying is he led you here. You couldn't get here on your own merit. You didn't get here by your good behavior. You didn't get here by coming to church and all of a sudden now you saved. You got here because he chose you, predestined you, and called you here. And if you see it like that, you'll be like, God, I don't know how I went from this place to this place. How did I go from clubbing every night to coming to the church? How did I go from not having a situation or relationship? Now I have a real relationship, not just with men and women, but with friendships, with brotherhood, accountability, fellowship, all the things that I got, you led me here. Even through, watch these words, the wilderness. So he's not talking about, it's different if he was talking to them in the promised land. Because it's easy to remember how good God's been when you're living in your blessing. It's hard to remember how good God is when you're still in the wilderness. You notice they ain't in the promised land yet. They're not even in with the milk and honey. They're not even made it yet. How many of us remember how good, not how decent, how good God's been even when you're still sitting in your wilderness? When it's still a desert in your life. How many of you are like, you know, God's been good. Even when all your problems ain't fixed, even when it's 11.59.59 and everybody starts to scream, pop the champagne and say, Happy New Year. Even when all of that happens and your life is still the same when you wake up, are you still going to say, man, God is good? Are you going to, but see, that takes a different mentality. That takes a non-complaining, joyous mentality. That takes you saying, you know what, man, I'm not just looking at all my problems and looking at all the things he sustained me with. I'm looking at the fact that some things in my life are still here. People are still here. Things are still here, even though I did nothing to keep them. That some, it takes you changing your mentality to do that. But he led you here. But then he gives you a timeline. He said 40 years. You notice he doesn't say last year. So if I were to challenge you, if I were to, I don't want to date nobody, but when I was at first service, I said 1940s, and somebody was like, whoo. I was like, whoo. God is good. But if I were to date this sanctuary and I say, hey, 1980s, 1990s, 1970s, 60s, I want you to look at all those years. See, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the new motto of let's only look at how good God's been in a year span. I want the motto when every time we get a new year, we look at how good he's been every year. I'm, but I'm not just talking about your blessings, y'all. Somebody, somebody tricked us into counting blessings. Somebody made us literally take up a prayer request sheet, start listing things before God, and until God checks off all of them, you've had a good year. But what about the things you forgot to check? What about the fact that your car still works? What about the fact that your job's still there? What about the fact that you still get to wake up in the morning? What about the fact that you breathe in new air? What about the fact that you have kids that are healthy? What about the fact that your kids go to school and come home every day and, no offense, have not gotten shot? What about the fact that you have your health, that you can breathe in air and breathe it back out? What about those small things that you don't write down because you take them for granted? But that's all the things that happen in the wilderness that we forget about. See, see. Pierre had to change his mentality because I'm, I'm preaching as a hypocrite. Right? Like, I forget that it's just a blessing to walk by their rooms at 5 in the morning and they're sleeping. Like, that's a blessing, man. They sleep. With the roof over their head, they sleep. They feel safe. And it's not because I can fight. It's not because I got a gun. They feel safe because for somehow God has been faithful to nothing happening to our home all these years. They just go lay their head down. Time to go to bed. Yes, dad. And they have confidence they go wake up in the morning. When did that stop being good enough? I told first service this. I hope this hit. In Matthew chapter 6. We often read this text, and we read this text, and it says that, hey, don't be anxious for tomorrow because tomorrow got enough problems of his own. But before that, he says he's going to take care of everything you need. And you know what? I've come to the realization, and I hope this hits you as much as it hit me when I read it again. 
Because I usually read it only because of anxiousness, but I started to realize that he only says there's only three things he's going to provide for, needs. I'm going to give you food, I'm going to give you clothing, and I'm going to give you covering. You know what America tricks us into? That's why we don't appreciate God. We get anxious about things that we add to our life. Like because we want another purse, we'll go in debt, then become anxious about the credit card. Because we want a, a car that we can't afford, we go get two jobs instead of one if we would just bought the car we could afford. So we'll create things to be anxious about, then get mad at God about the things he's not providing for when he's like, but I gave you a roof, I gave you food, and I gave you covering. Like, I, I'm doing everything that should make you feel safe. And for some reason, kids get it, but parents don't. Give a kid a Christmas gift, and they'll play with the box. It's a valuable lesson that sometimes God is like, man, enjoy the fact that I even gave you a gift. There's a box you can play in, too. It's a blessing. But let's move on. You, you, I don't think we realize that 40 years makes 2023 look like a blur. Don't get tricked into this Instagram post, and don't get tricked into posting your favorite memories. Because it's you no know it's funny about memories. Because just like we have good ones, we also have bad ones. And some of y'all came into the sanctuary having some bad memories, things that you don't like, things that you wish God would take away. And I'm like, hey, God has been faithful in the good and the bad ones. But you got to believe it. Because what if he tells you that 2024 is still your desert year? What if your DM still dry? What if your singleness is still dry? What if your marriage still lacks intimacy? What if your wife hasn't changed? What if your husband hasn't changed? What if your job don't change? We mad at God in 2025 and then we're going to repost it saying 2025 is my year? At some point, we got to accept reality and say, this is the year that God has given me, another day to go out and do what he's asked me to do and just to be obedient. At some point, it has to be okay. But again, he tells you what you're supposed to remember. He tells you how long. He wants you to flash back. But then he tells you what to remember. Now, watch what he says. He gives you two things, two words I want you to remember. He says this, I did this so I could humble you. Oh, man. He says, that he might humble you. This one hurts a little bit because it applies to me and hopefully it applies to you. Have you ever thought that sometimes you living in your desert season is not just God just allowing things to happen like just he forgot about you. It's the fact that he has a purpose to it. And one of those purposes to you sitting in your desert is not just the fact that you, no offense, they kept messing up in the desert. We'll talk about that another time. But it's the fact that he has lessons to be learned while you're in it. And one of those lessons to be learned while you're in it is the fact that he's saying, be humble. It's funny how this world tricks us into believing that you can pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. It's funny that many of y'all are tired today because of how much effort you put in to doing life your way, only for God to allow the desert to continue until you finally come to the conclusion, I can't fix nothing. Like, it's not until it hits you. It's not until somebody's like, I tried everything. You know what this word humble means? Dependency. You know what he's saying to them? In a desert, even though, can I tell you all some news? The trip in the desert doesn't take 40 years. If you look at your history and you look at the geography, you would realize it it wasn't a 40-year trip. It's not like they did it because they had to get there. They did it because they never learned their lesson. And so God is like, man, how many times I got to humble y'all? You need me. And the crazy thing about him having to prove to them that they need him is the whole time there's fire that's leading them at night. You would think if I had an ever-present fire in front of me that I knew I couldn't see without the fire, you'd be like, man, we sure need God. We would go nowhere. You would think that splitting a Red Sea would be enough for people to realize they need God because he had to kill all the Egyptians and make them wash up on a shore before they even sang a song. But he doesn't even tell them to remember that. You know what he tells them to remember? Manna. But before I even talk about manna, you know what else humble means? Is that you realize that you're just a natural person and the only person who can fix your problems is a supernatural fix. I want you to understand this, y'all. Some of y'all have been naturally trying to fix your problems every day. Some of us are working three jobs trying to fix your natural problems. God, this is a supernatural problem. You 
can't fix it. I'm not going to lie, I was at my job and I asked my boss this simple question. Kind of hurt, but it was true. I said, hey, man. It's not pastor, by the way. Y'all know I have to do both. I said, hey, what would you, he's been in the job 20 years. I said, what would you tell me in year two? You know what he told me? Don't die for this place. I'm thinking, you know, DTS, this is a godly seminary. You die in the service to the Lord. He was like, don't die for this place. That hit me. Because I'll be going to bed at like 10 p.m., answering emails, making sure that I get everything done for the next day, cleaning off my deck so I can go in the next day to accomplish my goals, having things written on the board that I need to get done. Meanwhile, this guy says, don't die for this place. And I'm looking at some of y'all, and some of y'all dying for a place that will move on when you die. He said, this, this institution has been around for 100 years. You don't think it's going to move on without you? I'm not going to lie, it kind of hurt. But it was honest. And some of us right now are naturally trying to work ourselves to a grave itself. And God is like, supernaturally just know that I got you. You don't need five jobs to get it done. If you need that much money and that much work to accomplish your vision board, maybe it ain't God's vision. I'm moving on. It says this, that he will humble you. And I'm going to get to this word testing, but he tells you what he's humbling you for. He humbled you, verse 3, that you and let you be hungry. Wait a second. God let them experience hunger? Oh, this one's going to hurt somebody. That he let them feel it. Now, did it mean they starved? No, a totally different Hebrew word. He let them be hungry. He let them feel that they couldn't feed themselves. <laughs> I don't know who in the sanctuary needs to hear this, but it is okay if you feel like you're hungry. Stop covering it up and stop going outside and eating fast food food and trying to supplement yourself when God is saying, it's okay because it teaches you you need me. I don't know who in this sanctuary has been feeding themselves, but I'm telling you, whatever you're doing on your own only leads to high cholesterol. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Some of us are functioning in spiritual diabetes because we keep feeding ourselves. And God's like, I wanted you to know you were hungry. Because if you know you're hungry, then you'll know when manna comes from heaven, you didn't do it. You can purse another, another thirst trap, and you can think, oh, I got him now. And God's like, that is called cholesterol. I needed you to live for me. You can't fix it. Let me rain it down from heaven. Because he says this word, and now I got to hit this point, and I'll move it. He says this, that you might understand Watch these words. Your humble let you be hungry and fed you with manna. Now, the crazy thing about this word manna is pay attention. There is not another word for it. It's not bread. Everybody, when they read it, like, oh, he just rained some bread, bread down from heaven. I wonder if it was all wheat. No, that's not what it's saying. The word manna, it means it comes from the mouth of God. So what are they saying? Only God made something that we have no idea what it is. We can only eat what he gave, and we only know it came from God because there's no other word for this what came from heaven. I guess what I'm trying to get you to understand is when you look back on hindsight 2020, you're going to be like, well, I know I didn't do this. I know I didn't even apply for this job. I know that I didn't even try to look for this man or this woman. I know that I didn't even try to fix my wife or my husband this year. I know all I did was live for the Lord, and somehow something rained down from heaven in my life. And I'm trying to get you to understand that some of y'all are wasting your time trying to rain down your own manna. And God is saying, this only pours out of my mouth. You can't even throw it up. You can't make this rain. Manna. 
He said, even your fathers didn't know where this came from. They didn't have a word for this. When God blesses you, you're going to start realizing you couldn't do it. But the more self-dependent you are is the more you give yourself credit. Some of y'all are walking around saying, we fixed our marriage, counseling fixed our marriage, a counselor fixed our marriage. Some of y'all are still saying, therapist fixed my life. And I'm like, hey, that's great. Seek all the resources God allowed. But at the end of the day, the only person who fixes your life is God. And one day when you stop giving everybody else credit, because America will distract you. You know what America's good to do? He wants to take the credit and shift it. And I really believe we're living in a generation that wants to consistently shift the credit to somebody else. Back in the day, though, I don't know why. Old school has got it. And I'm not trying to give credit and young people don't get it. I'm not, just be careful what I'm, I'm trying to be careful. But I just, I, I'm living in the middle. I feel like the middle child. And I'm sitting here and I'm watching first service where people with cancer praise louder than the people who don't. And I'm like, how do y'all get it? You would think you would be the quietest. You would think you'd be the most bitter you think you would be the person who's like, man, I ain't even going to church this Sunday. But we got people with both legs, healthy as all out, but have a one-month attendance to church. And I'm like, but somehow Mama Birdie, who still struggles with it, and people that are living with cancer that you don't even know about in this sanctuary, come to church every Sunday. And I'm like, yo, they, they must know a different manner. And let's just drop church attendance for a second. Let's just talk about growing. Let's just talk about the God is doing something in your life even while you're in your desert. But let me get off the manna tip because I know you probably got that point. Let's move to the next one. He says that you would know where it came from. But he says this verse, and I want you to read it because Jesus quotes it. He says this, man does not live by bread alone, but lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Even Jesus, when being tempted by Satan, quotes this text. So, if you don't know the power of this text, even Jesus goes back and tells Satan the same text. Hey, I don't need bread. But you know what this world tricks you in? That you need bread. They even name money bread. <laughs> Satan ain't got no new tricks. They start to make you believe that you only live by bread alone. That you only need God to give you another blessing. But can I say one last thing about manna and I'll stop. Did you know that God rained it daily? And you're like, well, that's great. Look at God. He's so good. No, hear me a second. They didn't have leftovers because it didn't last. You know what God was saying? Every day you are dependent for me to rain it down. Like, see, that's what difference is that I want people to wake up every day saying, God, thank you for another day. I want you to wake up every day saying, looking at the husband that's snoring every day and say, God, thank you for that snoring man. At least he's warm. <laughs> I want you to look back and say, wow, God, every day it is your sustaining power. But then he says another word. He said, I'm going to test you. Thank you, baby. Baby said, mm, wow. And y'all should get this. This is a wow point. You know what this word test means? He said, not only am I trying to humble you, he said, I'm testing you. Can I tell you this? And I promise you, we're going to move. The word test does not necessarily mean tempt. Satan tempts, but God knows no evil, so he doesn't tempt you with evil. Every time we keep saying, God, why'd you send this man in my life? He's like, that wasn't for me. That was your choice. But God is saying, when I use the word test, it's to ascertain for you to know who you are. Pay attention. I'm going to give you a test so that you would realize you don't depend on me at all. I already know where your heart is. Trust me, I've seen 2023. <laughs> but he's saying, I'm going to test you. Watch these words. So that you, would, you will learn where your faith really lies. The problem is when God gives you a test, do you pass it, do you run, or do you stall? See, some of us in the sanctuary stalled out. We're like, no, nah, I'm not moving. If 2024 doesn't start out with my blessings, we ain't moving. And God's like, move. Do you walk even when you don't know the results? No, not just this, but he's saying, 
Because the only way this word test works well is that the test reveals the purposes of God. Hear me out. Is that God tests you so that you can learn, so that you can learn his will for your life. But for some reason, we keep walking into church and having this random prayer life, God, what is your will? And he's like, will you just go through your test? If you go through your test, you will understand my will. But if you keep running from the test, you'll never understand nothing. So I stop and I ask this hard question that I need to live by. What did 2023 teach you? Because if the whole year didn't teach you nothing, then what was it for? Because guess what years become? Another year where you're asking God to give you more blessings. Rather than looking back, hindsight 2020, and say, that's what you taught me. See, I pray that in this sermon, this whole, all, everybody in this congregation walks away with saying, this is what God taught me. I remember this now. I remember I couldn't find a job for two months. What did he teach you? I remember when I was stressed out and anxious and couldn't sleep at night. What did he teach you? I remember when I had fear and I couldn't live and I was scared of my singleness. What did he teach you? Because if you get to 2024, that means he wanted you to live throughout 2023 so you will be different in 2024. But if you didn't learn nothing, it's a waste of a year. And I'm going to speak to my older saints. I'm going to say this and I'm going to say it humbly. That also applies to you. It also applies to the people who have been walking this walk for 20 years. What in your marriage is different than last year? What in you, how you live as a light and a witness at your job, what is different than last year? What do you know different theologically? Have you even challenged yourself apologetically? Do you even know how to read your Bible better than last year? Then no offense, all your stuff is is attendance. And if you're just a good attender and not a grower, then what's the point? I know a lot of people who attend barbershops, but they don't necessarily change their nothing. They just look good for a week. How do I know that? Because I used to go. You take pictures differently when you get a fade. But when you don't got a fade, you don't take pictures the same way. Dudes take pictures like this. And that's how we treat church. We go, we get cleaned up, we take pictures at brunch, and we maybe make it to church to get another fade. And God's like, what did you learn? There's one thing you can say here at Living Word Fellowship Church. We going to preach long enough for you to learn something. <laughs> like, there's no way you can be like, wait, I don't know, man, that was 15 minutes. No way. Talking about me and Pastor now, I'm getting long too. Let's get it. But then he says something. Watch these words. He starts to tell you what you should know. Thus you are to know in your heart. Now this is crazy. Thus you are to have intimate knowledge of what's in your heart. Now here's the kicker. It'd be different if he was saying, I test you so I can figure out what you're doing. No, no, no. He says the results. Thus you are to know. Because he already what? Knows. He just wants you to know, because if you know, hopefully you'll what? Change. So the whole time they're in the desert, he's like, well, y'all learn. I mean, I'm showing you, you ain't ready, because you know how they ain't ready, because they can keep doing the same thing. How do I know that? Go to 1 Corinthians when it says, learn from the Israelites and don't make the same mistakes. It literally says that. Don't do what they did in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. They kept doing it. And you know what one of the things they did? Idolatry. You know another thing they did? Complain. You know, another thing they did, keep reading. It. it just keeps listing over and over. And he's like, learn from their mistakes, man. They didn't learn. So now I look at y'all and say, what's in your heart? And stop blaming it on your circumstances. What comes out of your heart flows through your mouth. So if you cussing your husband out, that came from another place. That didn't just come from your untamed tongue. That was also a part of it. But what flows out of your mouth comes from your heart. That way, if I test you, even with your own husband or wife, that means it ain't your husband or wife to blame. That was your heart issue. See, here's the kicker. Everybody wants to change somebody in the sanctuary. Oh, man, if my husband would just change this one habit, he'd be a perfect husband. 
I'm going to tell you that he's going to fix that one thing and he's going to create a new one. I'm not worried about, stop making 2024 the year everybody else fixes themselves. It's funny because when we do that, for some reason we're acting like we perfect. Because your same husband is looking at you like, ooh, 2024 the year that she's going to stop. How about you focus on your heart? And then I ask the same question, what has God revealed about your heart? What area in your life is hard? You know how I know it's hard? You haven't changed it yet. You know what the word heart means? It's the same thing as your mind, but let me also get it. It says where your attitude, your will lies. If your will and your attitude hasn't changed, your heart is in the same place. Like some of us, even for myself, we can come to church with the same attitude. And God's like, your heart's the same. And I keep, I'm going to stop using church. What about the way you act at work? What about the way you drive? <laughs> that was the quietest laugh I've ever heard in my life. I heard. <laughs> Whoever that was cussed somebody out on the way here. It's like, uh. I'm just joking. All right. Test. But then he says something that nobody wants to hear. He says this. Your God was disciplining you. He's saying, hey, man, the last definition of testing means chastising. You know what he's saying? I was trying to discipline you so you would learn. You stayed in the desert 40 years and you still didn't learn. Just learn. Discipline's supposed to cause correction. And you know how many of us got lost when we were parents, or still are, is we only discipline to create what? Control. God doesn't discipline to control you. He disciplines to change you. And that's how we should parent, really, to be honest. You don't, if you still do discipline, I heard there's a new thing called gentle parenting. It's hilarious, by the way. Not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's there. Just do what you do. Can I tell you this story? First time in my life, and I got to be fast. Me and Monica were on a date night. Probably the same time we were talking about every guy that failed. And this, this kid, we just hear him talking the whole time. Meanwhile, I'm trying to romance my wife. I'm looking into her eyes with these dark black eyes. And then I hear this is not exaggeration. It has nothing to do with my sermon. Y'all, gotta, y'all just got to let me vent this out. And I'll be done after this. I hear this. Ben, don't know his name. Forgot it as soon as I heard his response. Could you go get mommy's cup? Now, remember, they're only six steps away from the table. Like, I, I watched them. How did I know that? Because I was watching now. Now, because they've been loud the whole day. So I'm like, who was this family? I couldn't see him, but I saw them, and they walked past. And he was like, this is not exaggerating. I promise you I'm not making this up. I got to go fast. He goes, ugh. The last time I, now remember this kid's six. The last time I checked, the cup was your responsibility. I was like, yo, it's going down today. <laughs> that kid fixing to fly. And y'all think I'm lying. I, y'all think I'm lying. I promise you, you ask Monica after church, this is a true story. This is me while he turns around. He was like, if you would take care of your stuff, I wouldn't have to go get it. I said, gentle parenting is amazing. Because <laughs> that kid is free. I mean, this kid lives life. So I thought for sure when this kid get back to his mama, something fitting to happen. Like, you know when you wait on a fight? Like, you like, <laughs> pull out your phone. <laughs> this is when I knew. Ben. Was that the proper words to use to your mother? <laughs> this kid looked at his mom and said, mm-hmm. I said, oh. And he gets a ride home too? Jesus. <laughs> Told you I had nothing to do with my sermon, but it talked about parenting. Please don't do that. All right, here we go. Then he says this word I want you to gather. It says this. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell. 
he goes back to 40 years. I want to close off these last two. I want you to know. You may not have got out of your desert. But all the things you wore, the things you left Egypt with, they still work. The clothes don't got no holes in them. And your feet haven't swelled in them same sandals. For somebody who keeps looking at 2024 as a year of blessings, stop and just start looking back at 2023 and say, what did you sustain in my life? See, here's the kicker. I think we complain a lot because we forget that even the things that God just says, I'm going to sustain is your blessing. What about the things in your life? What about your marriage that he sustained? What about your relationship? What about your singleness that he sustained? What about the things that you keep saying, oh, man, I wish he would change this? God's like, what about you start thanking me for sustaining it? What about the fact that you haven't swollen up yet? What about the fact that nothing in your life has changed even though you haven't kept your side of the deal? I keep sustaining you. Here's the last thing I'll say about 40 years. They lasted 40 years doing the same thing. See, we keep looking at 40 years like, man, that's a punishment. That's how gracious God was. Can you envision that? Some of us are walking on that 40-year grace. And you over here talking about, I wish they would fix their life. And God's like, I'm looking at you like, this is your desert 40 years. Will you fix it? And God's like, because everything you're complaining about, I'm sustaining something else. Everything you're complaining about. But you know what Satan's good at? Telling you you need something else. And don't tell me America ain't good for it. You get a car, you need another one. You get a phone, you got to upgrade. They don't, they bold, they just call everything an upgrade. They just change one camera and talking about, whew, iPhone 16 finna blow your mind. Because if I can make you need something else, you'll never thank God for what he's sustaining. And some of y'all are falling victim and Pierre Canis is falling victim. Needing something else. Sooner or later, this tight stew is going to go out of style, and I'm going to keep wearing it. (laughs) But then he tells you what you should do. He says, therefore. You notice he didn't say anything about future blessings. He just said, since I've done all this. You notice this? The whole time he told you why you should obey, guess what he said? Remember. He didn't say anything about what he's fixing to do. So no offense, can we stop doing 2024? This is going to be my year and start saying, God, thank you for the 40. Thank you for keeping me. Thank you for sustaining me. Thank you for the fact that I go into a closet. Thank you for the fact that I go in. Some of us have storage units. Some of you have shoe closets. Shoe closets. So you can wear it once to twice a year. Moving on. I don't want to, I'll stop. I would stop on that point. I want you all to go to Africa and tell people about your shoe closet. It says this, therefore, you shall keep. There's three things I'm going to end with, three words. Keep it. Keep the commandments. Simple. I said, what are you telling you to do? Since I did all this, keep doing righteousness and justice. That's what that word means. Keep doing the ways in which I told you. Do the commandments, be righteous, be just. So 2024 is a year, hopefully, of people doing what they were told and not waiting on a blessing to complete it. Second, he says, walk with me. You know, the killer thing about walking is that they should know it the best. Walk in his ways. Just walk. You know, walk means conduct your life. Conduct your life in the ways in which I tell you. So keep the commandments, sorry, let me get this definition right. And ways means righteousness and justice. So therefore, what he's saying is keep everything I told you to do. Don't change, don't shift. Don't let circumstances shift your obedience. Then I want you to walk with me. That means everything I tell you to do, you do. And you conduct your life as if I'm telling you to do it. And then the last thing I say, fear me. Three of them. But here's the comparison that I want you to gather. Out of everything that has happened in the 40 years, is obedience so hard when you remember well? It's not. Everybody acts like God is asking you to do a lot. And then God is in this somehow prove it pattern. The more he has to prove is the more you'll obey. And God's like, if you remembered how consistent I've been for your 30 years of existence, 
and the fact that I still chose you despite your sin, asking you to keep, walk, and fear ain't that hard. You know what fear means? To be in awe of him. We are raised in a culture where the song has to be right before we're in awe of a God. The sermon has to be right before it makes you say amen. That somehow the church has to be more comfortable in order for you to attend. And somehow we have to make it more relevant, somehow keep breaking barriers of relevancy. Then our preachers are now eisegeting the text to make people say amen. But if people were just in awe of God, they wouldn't need a preacher. I, I would just be up here to read the word and you'd be like, whew, he was on fire today. And that's it. Are you in awe of God? But not because of what he's going to do, because he's already done enough. I love people, especially my, 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 my seasoned saints. I remember I told the story about my fridge breaking. And this is what I love about fridge breaking, is that when you get off the, the podium, somebody's going to tell you what fridge to buy. <laughs> Frigid air. Had my frigid air for 30 years. <laughs> Baby, if you want a fridge that won't break, frigid air. <laughs> and I walk past somebody else. And this is not an exaggeration. Whirlpool. Want a fridge that won't break? Had my whirlpool 60 years. <laughs> Never broke. You go buy somebody else, tell them you got to buy a car. Ford. Had my Ford 150 truck. 75 years. Never broke. I still drive my Model T from 1945. It's because when a brand's been good to you, you remember how long it's been with you. But if you start to realize the brand of God has been around more than your Ford truck and your Whirlpool fridge, and you start to realize that it never failed you. When you start to realize that you open God and God is still breathing cold air into your life, when you start to realize that it starts to store food in your life, when you start to realize that it never breaks, when you start to realize that the brand of God ain't never failed and it's been consistent in your life, sustaining the things that it needed to sustain, maybe you'll start walking around this church saying, you should fear him. You should be in awe of him. You should tell people about him because this God that I serve, even though I messed up, Every time I open it, it's cold air. Let us pray. We are excited that you have joined us, and I pray this message touched your life. We pray that you enjoyed it. We pray that it impacted your heart, and we hope that you would subscribe and continue to grow with all the messages that are here. You can find a sermon outline. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Look forward to you coming back so we grow together. Thank you for blessing us and for blessing your life by allowing us to serve you.